Technical Information Center webinar. Uh, today we're here to talk all about traffic signals, uh, specifically about how we can make them work better uh, for bicyclists and pedestrians. We're going to be covering a lot of really important uh, topics today, and we really look forward to diving right in. Uh, my name's Dan Jolene. I'm here with the Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center, and I'm going to be facilitating the webinar today. Uh, we're really excited to have Peter Kuntz with us today to lead the webinar. Uh, Peter is a professional engineer from Portland, Oregon, who has worked in both the public and private sector and has served as an adjunct professor at Portland State University teaching graduate level courses in transportation engineering. He's a member of the Bicycle Technical Committee of the National Committee on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, representing the Association of Pedestrian and Bicycle Professionals. He's also, uh, he also serves as chair of the TRB, the Transportation Research Board's Committee on Traffic Signal Systems. Uh, we're grateful to have Peter here with us today uh, to share his expertise on this really important topic. Um, I'm going to spend uh, as little time as I can kind of running through some housekeeping so we have plenty of time to get right into the presentations uh, and the discussion. Um, as attendees, it's important for you to know that you won't have the ability to speak during the webinar, uh, but you will have the ability to send us questions, uh, comments, and notes throughout the session. We're going to be uh, monitoring those as we go along, uh, and we'll keep uh, enough time, probably 30 Three minutes at the end uh, to have a facilitated discussion session based on the presentation today. So we'll look forward to that. Please uh, don't hesitate to send us your questions. Um, in terms of follow-up after the webinar, uh, we've already posted a copy, a PDF copy of the presentation slides on our website, pedbikeinfo.org slash webinars. You can find that um, right, on, right on the website there. Uh, we are going to be adding uh, a recording, a video recording of this webinar within a day or two uh, after the session's over, uh, along with some other links to helpful resources. So all that you can find on our website. Uh, you're going to be receiving a follow-up email later today that's going to include a few things. One, it'll include that link to our archive page where you can find this information. It's going to include a link that will allow you to download a certificate of attendance for the webinar. Uh, so it's really important uh, if you're attending with more than one person in the same room, um, you're going to be receiving that email if you registered. So just be sure to pass that along to the other folks who you're with. Um, they'll be able to then generate their own certificate of attendance. We've also submitted the webinar uh, for 1.5 CM credits. Uh, if that applies to you, you can find those on the uh, AICP, the APA website. Um, and uh, finally, that email uh, will include some uh, useful information about our upcoming webinars. Uh, so keep an eye out for that. It should be coming to you later this afternoon. Uh, PBIC offers webinars uh, about every month on a variety of topics. So if you haven't attended our sessions, I'd encourage you to visit pedbikeinfo.org slash webinars. Uh, to view the archives of our past um, episodes and, and register for the ones that are coming up. Uh, we're going to be talking about this session on Twitter today using hashtag PBIC webinar. If you'd like to get in, involved there, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be doing that. Um, another way you can keep up with us is by um, following us on social media, pedbikeinfo, pedbikeinfo is our handle. And then our newsletter, uh, pedbikeinfo.org slash sign up uh, is, a, is a way to get some regular emails from us on everything we have going on. We do have one webinar um, that we're just announcing today, um, scheduled for November 8th. It's going to be all about uh, addressing speed-related crashes and really framing this issue uh, as, uh, and focusing on protecting children. Uh, so talking about how you can get a speed management programs started by focusing on school zones and child safety. Uh, so that'll be November 8th, uh, 3 to 4.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Um, we're going to have a great panel, uh, people from the National Transportation Safety Board, LA DOT, New York City DOT. So be sure to join us for that. Uh, you can find more information about pedbikeinfo.org slash webinars. And then I'm going to be including a, a, a link to that in the chat pod in just a second here. You can get more information. Before we really kick things off with the session today, I want to launch a quick poll um, just about uh, to find out how many people are out there today. So if you can take a moment and let us know if it's just you attending the webinar from your location, uh, if you've got a few people with you, um, a group of two or three, four or five or more, um, we just want to find out a bit more. Um, get a bit better information about how many people are out there today. Um, and then we'll be moving right into our presentation. So just about probably 10 or 15 more seconds on the poll and we'll close that up and, and get started. Okay. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much, everybody. We're going to close that now um, and spend as much time as we can on the feature presentation today. So I'll be handing over control. Uh, to Peter. And uh, Peter, keep an eye on the screen. Uh, you should um, see that alert come across and you should be able to go full screen with your slides. 
Okay, perfect. You're all set, Peter. Okay. Well, Dan, thanks for the introduction and, and setting us up, and uh, uh, welcome everybody to the webinar. Uh, I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about uh, making signals work for people who are cycling and, and walking. Um, this uh, presentation is really a, a culmination of a, a wide variety of things that I've uh, learned, and, and I'm really excited about the range of, of people that have reached out to me in advance of the webinar asking questions. So I did my best to uh, you know, look at my material and try to answer those, but there was no overwhelming uh, response. So we'll, um, I, I tended towards, uh, with this first webinar, um, as a, with the interest, I think we're gonna have a second or third webinar. We'll talk a little about that later. Um, but there's so many questions that we really uh, we, we can't cover them all with, and get into the amount of detail that I'd really like to. So we kind of tended towards being a little more general with this webinar. So you'll you'll see that. And if you've uh, if you were looking for more detail, I'll just I'll just maybe apologize in advance. Maybe we can get into the questions um, that that come up uh, with with some more detail. But the outcomes we're really trying to talk about how. We use traffic signals to make intersections safer and more comfortable. Uh, that's really the, you know, the, the crux of the, the opportunity that exists here with, uh, with, with, with the traffic signals. Um, and, and there are certainly some uh, strategies for improving intersections as we, as we think about the basics. So we'll try to get into that and, and, and again, keep it a, a bit high level. Um, of course, we'll, we'll have a, a few minutes for discussion period and, and, and questions to be answered. Um, I've got my list of questions here that were submitted in advance, so that's a, it's a it's a long list. So we'll we'll do our best here. The you know the users of the traffic signal. So I, I think a lot about this in terms of my uh, my own experience, and 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 this is my daughter, my uh, 11 year old daughter Amelia, who uh, who wanted to ride her bike to school on on bike to bike school day, International Bike School Day, just a couple weeks ago, and and you know so. So in Portland, we think about the users of the traffic signal. This is this is this is our design vehicle, if you will. So, you know, thinking about how someone that's 11 years old could could bike through a, a, a series of intersections. And so, this particular project, this is a brand new traffic signal that we implemented. Um, that it's really a uh, designed with her in mind, thinking about the land use, of course, in the context um, in in our neighborhoods. We made this connection across. Uh, Southeast Stark Street there is a, is a it was, which was a fairly busy crossing. So if you think about this notion of, of safety and comfort, uh, this intersection is a fairly good representation of what one, one can do. So we have a bike signal that you see there uh, to navigate the intersection. We've limited the turn movements, so we have less crossing. So you can see on the far side of the intersection is a right turn only for cars. Um, so it's, we've eliminated conflicts here within the within the traffic signal, and then of course provided signal timing that is responsive to to someone on a bike. So the detector, you can see the black lines and the green uh, green markings there are really trying to communicate what we intend for her to do as she navigates navigates this this street. So we done a lot of work in safety and of course efficiency uh, if you date back to the start of my career this notion of comfort and measuring comfort is really an emerging element that is uh, it is something of, of, that is uh, we, we that we need to focus more on if we're going to get people walking and biking uh, even even more so this notion of levels of traffic stress if you haven't seen this uh, it's uh, work that Peter Firth and others have have been developing and been working through to try to characterize what it is we're designing and, and design users. You could look at this as akin to level of service, having some rating one through four that basically says whether a transportation facility is has a high level of stress or low level of stress. So level of stress one means that it's physically separated or mixed flow, so comfortable for children. So that's and that's really been you know, our design um, for our neighbor greenways or, or many agencies call them bicycle boulevards. And then when we get to these busy crossings, you'll note in the level of traffic stress that it isn't entirely clear what you should do at intersections. So I would say 
you know, the conclusion of this slide, and, and we can talk a little more about that, is that more research is needed on intersection treatments, uh, traffic signals, rapid flash beacons, uh, pedestrian hydro beacons, and what level of comfort exists with those that variety of treatments and other treatments as well. Uh, so I will show you a few examples where we have jumped to traffic signals and, and specifically staying with the topic of traffic signals. But the issue of comfort is still one where I would say we don't have all the answers. So in, in this case, here she is crossing through the intersection. Of course, as a, as a, as a responsible parent and a, and a traffic engineer that's always trying to learn more, I, I did a quick interview and asked her if she understood understood what this was and, and whether this met her needs and of course her immediate response was that the car on the far side of the intersection that white car on the right there is close is parked too close for her to feel comfortable so the, the yellow striping led right into the car and so of course that goes into the that goes into the complaint category of uh, we could make this a bit more comfortable if we restricted parking and, and of course ease the transition once we get past the traffic signal ease the transition back into the the shared street environment. Uh, uh, that's a that's a, a fairly low volume, low speed street. So, uh, you know, I think uh, one one eleven asking one eleven year old whose dad is a traffic engineer is probably not uh, sufficient research from which to form a, a level of traffic stress. So uh, again, we need we need a little bit more information there to really make uh, make a determination of what works for everybody. So this notion of comfort I, I mentioned is new. Um, what isn't new is, is, is efficiency of traffic flow. So I want to just talk a bit as a backdrop for this. Um, and one of the reasons I think the engineering community and even the, the transportation community in general has struggled with, uh, with making walking and biking better is that we have often been very mobility focused and efficiency focused. So as a traffic engineer, um, I worked on tra time space diagrams for traffic signals. So if you uh, this this slide shows a traditional diagram taken right from a traffic signal timing manual if you if you haven't heard of that that's what a traffic engineers use to understand how traffic signals should be timed um, and it's a fairly recent document i guess less than 10 years old and there's a second edition now that's that focuses on how the traffic signals should be coordinated and, and whether they should be coordinated and and how you might just do that so this notion of traffic signal coordination is really designed to, to move cars through a series of intersections. So those blue lines represent the trajectory of cars. And our objective in many cases has been to not stop cars at subsequent intersections. So if you look at those blue lines, that is would be considered a bandwidth through a series of four traffic signals, four intersections that's shown on the left side with time on the x-axis and distance uh, on the y-axis, with time only going forward, of course. You can only move forward in time. So this is where I think if we think about making traffic signals work for pedestrians and, and bicyclists, it's, it's sometimes it's, it's requiring us to rethink these time space diagrams and perhaps interrupt the traffic flow for efficient and and Quick, quicker response to people on the side street, to people crossing. So in this case, the, the red time is what we would look at of when that happens and how disruptive uh, is that? And, and can we be more disruptive to make things better for people walking and biking? So, so this is what traffic engineers will often say is that we can't disrupt that traffic flow, that it will result in and, and challenges associated with moving cars. And so what I want to just draw your attention to uh, is the policy that's there and, and that we have often built traffic signals to stop people. And that's something that it's a good reminder that traffic signals are designed to do that. So that's uh, something that we have to think about is whether that we want to stop people that are driving or we want to stop people that are biking and, and what are the ramifications of that. In, in that time space diagram, we have speed as an assumption. Often we uh, time traffic signals for the speed of cars that are out there. Uh, early on in my career, I was asked to optimize the flow of traffic signals and often measure the speeds and then, and then try to optimize the traffic signals 
for the speed of cars that are on that our trail. And perhaps that speed is above the speed limit. So what I like to say is that speed is a critical assumption if you're designing new traffic signal timing plans or even modifying the ones that you have. Be careful about that assumption. Be deliberate about that assumption and, and I'll get into more detail about that. As I mentioned, policy and context, uh, that's all important. The, the signal timing manual, uh, the traffic signal timing manual does a great job of describing that. And then lastly, all of us have bias. So whether you're uh, thinking about it from your perspective as a driver, uh, if you're talking to the signal timing engineer, you know, you could think about whether they drove to work today or whether they biked to work, the, those sorts of things that we all have bias. And so that's something that we have to think about is how that bias affects our solutions. So as I mentioned, we're building traffic signals to stop people. I just want to remind people of that because often we think about traffic signals it's like, well, we want it to work for everyone and it should be, should be all, all encompassing and imperfect. And of course, that's, that's not the reality. Uh, we, we give this mindset as traffic engineers that we're moving cars. And, and that's, a, I think, a fundamental shift is to try to help the engineers recognize that there are different perspectives and policies that may be adopted. Um, and, and so this notion of tying our policies, tying our goals to uh, different objectives uh, than speed of travel on an arterial is, is really uh, a big piece of the puzzle is how, what performance measures are we using to assess whether we've done a good job with traffic signals. Uh, so that's something that I have to remind engineers that I work with is, you know, the, 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 the performance measures that we're getting from the traffic engineering models, the, the, the traffic si signal timing models uh, may not be appropriate depending on the context and where we are in downtown in downtown Seattle, for instance, you know, the, the, the one of one goal may be moving bikes or moving, moving uh, people safely. So, so thinking about your context, what, what is that policy? So overall today's message, well, traffic signals can help shape places. So if I time those traffic signals for the speed of traffic that are out there today, you know, that may affect uh, the, the potential for things like street cafes or, or street seats to, to, uh, to work well. So we have to think about speed and how that affects things. And then really there's a lot of interest and, and need for research to improve the design, uh, meet new challenges associated with traffic signals. So uh, those are the, those are the I, hope, I hope that I leave you with those as key takeaways as a part of this. Now I'm gonna draw from uh, not only the traffic signal timing manual, but also the NACTO urban street design, a document that I was, I was lucky enough to help advise on related to traffic signals. And, and, and think about these principles re related to from a, from a city transportation official, what are the common things that are needing to be addressed as a part of uh, the work that we're doing? And so, you know, this notion of we're always integration, integrating time and space at the key fundamental principle. Um, we're, we're balancing the needs of functions uh, and functions of different time periods. So if you think about the traffic signal, it runs 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you know, does that traffic signal respond to the needs of the, of the community during the off hours, during the, during the lunchtime? Those, that's the, the, the second, second bullet, the second quote there, streets designed for peak intervals. So those, those AM, we're only setting them up for AM, PM peak hour. We, they, may, they may fail to provide a safe and attractive environment. So Think about that in terms of how the traffic signals operate in your community and whether you could, what you could do to make them, make them better. And if I think about that, you know, that this notion of mobility and mobility is changing clearly in our cities. Uh, it's a good example. This is a, this is a group ride in Chicago um, that I was on, but, but thinking about it in terms of the number of cars in Portland, you know, we have had uh, cities, uh, the city changed so much that uh, in some cases we're moving more people by bike uh, than we are by car. And so how do we adjust traffic signals to accommodate future growth? It's, it's really, it's, it's going to be more multimodal than, than, uh, than moving people by car. So the active urban street design guide leaves, leaves us with principles, signalization principles. Uh, and, and those are a worthy starting point for 
the discussion of today's webinar is, is and there's six principles related to how we work and make traffic signals more effective for people in a multimodal environment at short, short cycle lengths. So the signal cycles, how long it takes to serve the different movements, prioritizing multimodal travel, minimizing number of signal phases, set slow progression speeds, adjusting timing for off-peak, as I mentioned before, and then considering fixed time signals. And so I'll just critique, I'll just critique those and actually add one more element as a part of this, uh, because this is something that uh, there is not a one-size-fits-all for how traffic signals will work. And that's actually one of the complexities and one of the things I enjoy most about traffic signals is it does depend on the context. Shortening the signal cycles can be good um, in downtown Portland. I'll talk about that um, in the next few slides. Uh, we have a very short cycling, and that can be very good for delay, uh, for, for thinking about the delay of people walking. Uh, prioritizing multimodal travel, well, clearly that's something that walking and cycling uh, would benefit from. Minimizing number of signal phases, I put, I put that in red because I actually just want to draw a little attention to that and say we, we have to caution ourselves. Sometimes the, by having uh, mi a minimal number of signal phases, we, we may actually result in, in people taking gaps or having to uh, try to take gaps. And, and, and that's not something that's necessarily uh, good from a safety standpoint. So I just caution you on that principle. But setting slow progression speeds, adjusting time for off-peak, those are things that I wholeheartedly endorse. Um, considering fixed time signals, that really depends on your objective. And then finally, this new bullet of employ advanced logic and detection. That's something that I'll get to in the slides and just touch on briefly as we, as we kind of look ahead to uh, uh, you know, what, what can be possible in, in a traffic signal. So shortening the signal cycle lengths will certainly you have to you know, it's a, it's a little bit of a push-pull. We have to accommodate, we want to accommodate, we need to accommodate pedestrian crossing, uh, wheelchair crossing. Um, so the, the speed of three and a half feet per second has been uh, there for quite a while for pedestrian crossings, providing enough walk time and then flash to walk time to cross the street. And sometimes if you're on a busy arterial, you know, it's not, not, not appropriate to have, not possible to have a 90 second cycle length, which, is, which, which would be considered ideal. Uh, but but that's something that again from a from a street design standpoint, uh, the width of the street does matter and it, it can result in long cycle lengths that are not great for for people walking. But if you can minimize the or shorten the signal cycle lengths, that that can be really good because then you are providing more opportunities for people to walk and to cross the street than you would if you 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 you, you didn't have you had a longer cycle length. So 60 90 seconds we talk about that. No, that's appropriate in downtown settings. And, and, and so that's a piece of the puzzle. So if you think about this intersection, if you're not, uh, you know, of course, uh, many of you are not familiar with signal cycle links or, or thinking about those signal timing details. Certainly if you, uh, this, this intersection is, a, is a, just a separating north, south from east, west, in this case, uh, actually just southbound from eastbound, a one-way one -way street pair. Uh, you know, if you think about that cycle length, that what it says, what it suggests, if you do the math, is that the, the maximum delay time for someone trying to cross the street uh, by foot, by wheelchair, by bike, the maximum delay time would be 30 seconds if we split the signal signal time um, for each movement. So that's that's a that's relatively good. And in this case, actually, in downtown Portland, we have um, a lot of jaywalking that happens, and 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 so that's a Essentially, it's because uh, people are assessing and, and feeling like the risks of crossing the street against the signal are, the risks are very low because the speeds are managed. Um, and I'll get to that in a few slides as well. The other uh, player uh, in this, uh, of course, this multimodal environment is transit. Transit uh, that, that, uh, that has frequent stops and frequent loadings does benefit from shorter cycling. I think the first time I read that was in Jane Jacobs' Death and Life of Great American Cities. Uh, when she was talking about this issue. It's uh, something that uh, you know, doesn't, didn't necessarily occur to me. It's not something that we, we often hear in, uh, in, in standard traffic engineering, but certainly as you think about it more and more, uh, the more frequent green opportunities, the, the better it can be for buses uh, to have a shorter cycle. Moving on to slow progression speed. So 
Uh, this is actually a slide, uh, a, a, a photo uh, in from a, a photo that's an old traffic signal. It's in, on the Oregon coast, uh, and the signal set for 20 miles an hour is a is a uh, standard sign that's in the METC and has been for a long time. But certainly, setting slow progression speed is not a new topic. It's something that um, we can do. So that's why I say that choosing a progression speed is really very important and can essentially reduce uh, the risk for other users. If you think about uh, this, you can apply that not only for, for people driving at 20 miles an hour, but you can also apply it for people cycling. And so this is something that uh, they have done, uh, I think first saw done in Europe and in and, and Copenhagen, they have signals timed for 12 to 15 miles an hour. Uh, in Portland, in, we have a bicycle greenway. So if you Google that or actually search that on YouTube, you will find uh, videos that show uh, just how that works. San Francisco has done this as well. So and they've put up signs that say just that, just like Copenhagen had, and they have criteria that's worth worth reporting on to talk about uh, when they do this. So they they have done this on several quarters now, but their criteria that, that we have more than three traffic signals in a row that's on the city bike network with a bike lane, the same signal cycle, and then outside the, the, the grid of downtown. So uh, a nice set of criteria to think about this in terms of where might you uh, implement a green wave. And what does that mean, green wave? Well, as I mentioned before, we often set signal timing for, for cars. And so this is my car slide. I'll get you to the bike slide or the next Next one, but the signals for in this instance, in this example, I had a set of signals over time for 30 miles an hour. So that slope of that line, distance divided by time, is, is a car can get through at 30 miles an hour. If you're on your bike, uh, it's the orange line here, you could actually leave at the same time as the car and get to the next signal because the distance was so far. You could get to the next signal and still it would still be green, just barely green, but you could get through without stopping at 22 miles an hour. So certainly, if you think about the, the speed of bikes, and I think about my 11-year-old, uh, she can go 22 miles an hour, but but it's not the safest speed to go. So we we kind of reconsidered what the speed might be and, and rethought about where we might change that signal timing and move that offset out uh, and, and uh, changed our signal speed, the progression speed setting. In this case, uh, you just slide that offset to the side and, and have an assumed speed of 13 or 15 or 20 miles an hour, something slower than the traditional 30 miles an hour that we had to make the signal work better uh, for people that are cycling on the main street. So this is a little bit different than that earlier description of crossing the main street. This is biking along the main street. So uh, this is applicable for, for the coordinated movements along a corridor. So again, uh, choosing that speed, it, it can be based on the speed of the bike traffic. It can be based on the uh, speed of, of what might also work reasonably well for cars. Um, so I think that's, a, that's, again, a critical assumption in this and thinking about whether the system is designed to be effective for the users that you're, you're wanting to design for. So in this case, uh, just going back to the overall theme of progression speeds in downtowns, certainly coordinated signal timing to prioritize pedestrian or bicycle travel. Uh, prioritizing pedestrian travel certainly is keeping the cycle length uh, short, as, as short as possible. For bicycle travel, it's about progression speeds. Uh, but I will say uh, also with progression speeds that slower progression, progression speeds do help pedestrian uh, travel as well because of uh, the notion that if you are uh, in the, in the uh, unfortunate event that you do have a pedestrian car crash, if those cars are going slower, there is a safety benefit associated with that. So setting the signal timing for a lower speed, uh, and you can relate it back to level of traffic stress, it is a, is a worthwhile objective. So this is, a, I'd say, an example where we looked at speeds before changes, and we sent out uh, someone to collect data uh, we, we capture the data and what you would what you would see uh, as a standard green, yellow, red sort of format. 
in, in Google traffic or, or whatever, real time, real time speed uh, monitoring system you might have. Uh, but the difference here for if you're truly focused on walking and cycling is you can you may see uh, what we have done that's different. And I'll just give you a second to look at that carefully. Um, and, and in this case, what we've done is you think about red, you think about, well, that's, that's maybe it's, it's bad, it's stopping. But in, in this case, actually, it's the reverse. So we have given feedback to the engineers that green is good, that uh, slower speeds are actually better. And what we really want to do is think about where the speed where speeding is occurring. So if you have vehicle speeds in a downtown or, or dense urban setting that are greater than 30 miles an hour, one of the objectives could be, well, we'll actually look to change the signal timing to try to try to spread that speed out. So we reduce the incentive of people to speed up by changing the offsets of the signals. And so Again, just a subtle modification of assumptions and the feedback to the engineers. You know, this, this, uh, the, the positive response we got actually from the community of doing this was was really was really quite quite good. Because um, if you think about the the nature of the context of this, uh, this was uh, the, the, the community wanted more consistent travel speeds and and more reliable flow. And this is similar to what San Francisco MTA has done with their green waves. So this is the uh, essentially the um, assessing uh, a trajectory. So that blue line is a trajectory of speed and measuring speed along a corridor. They have the uh, essential the the speed as it it's going along as a cyclist is going along. And you can see the difference in in when they're uh, slowing and when they're coming back and forth southbound and northbound and how that can affect the overall performance uh, both before and then after after the operations so that's an operations piece of the puzzle that again uh, is, is worthwhile I'm going to get into now some of the more design elements that are important for making people walking that people that are walking and cycling uh, effective and this is a one of my favorite case studies, it's a, a regional trail that's uh, just outside of Portland. And it's the trail comes uh, along in a linear format and at, it intersects at this traffic signal. And so before the, uh, the before conditions in this case was that the people biking and walking would have to take a two-stage uh, approach to this intersection using the crosswalks that were marked. The after conditions was a diagonal crossing to allow people biking to go diagonally through the intersection. So uh, uh, something that makes essentially the, the path continuous through the traffic signal uh, and adds a signal phase through the intersection to try to make a, a more uh, continuous flow for people walking and cycling. So a from a design standpoint, uh, this capital improvement, the change actually was a fairly low cost using the existing signal poles and mounting, in this case, a bike signal on the far side of the intersection, putting in detection so that uh, it was clear where a cyclist should wait to be able to make the diagonal movement uh, is, a, is a, essentially a nod to making a, a comfortable and safer facility. We also done a similar application in Portland. I'll go into more detail about a very similar sort of path that had a two-phase crossing where you had to, as you were cycling and leaving this, uh, this guideway, this, this trail environment, getting onto a street, you would have to uh, use that two-stage crossing. And the solution here is just a diagonal crossing uh, that would allow the movement that was really the, the primary um, direction that people wanted to travel through the intersection uh, to really have that be a, a single application. The various elements associated with this, you know, if you're driving through this intersection, you may not expect traffic, bicycle traffic to come at a diagonal. So we had some of the uh, other trap control devices to modify in addition to the existing traffic signal was there. We had a node 
right turn on red display uh, when that green indication is on. And then of course, uh, as we've built this, uh, we've, we've had a, a good number of people uh, using it and the growth in, in the use because it makes more sense than the other alternatives. Uh, it's, it's been phenomenal to have that level of, of uh, acceptance and, and compliance as it's coming along. The, 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 getting back to the design user, we want to make sure these, these, these intersections are, are good for, again, the 11 year old, the, the mother that is, in this case, the mother that's carrying their, uh, their children to school or to, to work. Uh, and, and so th that's the sort of thing that uh, if, if we contemplate traffic signal design, we, we reduce the delay for these users, and that's a really a positive thing for uh, increasing the comfort. One more example of a bike signal uh, from a design standpoint, and, and, and um, in this case, uh, we have a, a dual right turn uh, and a bike signal that is curb tight that we implemented um, you can again see the no turn on red in this case uh, for the, the adjacent uh, tra right turn travel. So the bike movement is active, is green. Um, and if you're driving, you're held, if you're held for that movement while the adjacent through green, uh, through is green. So if you're traveling parallel with the bike movement, you're allowed to go. Uh, and then the immediate next interval of time is. Uh, is a yellow indication, the red uh, for the bike movement, and then the right turns are allowed to go. Um, like you see here, uh, this is that red interval that clears the bikes, uh, clears the bike traffic from the intersection. Uh, and the next second is that uh, it's going to be the green right turn for, for this movement. So that's something that, again, from a design standpoint, um, how does that work? Well, it's, it's a variety of different applications there that are worth, uh, of course, worth mentioning the part-time, the PTR sign, the part-time restriction sign, the bike signal sign. Um, we use a 12-inch uh, far side bike signal. Um, we had the 8-inch display on the near side, and we could have used a 4-inch signal display. Um, happy to talk, and there was a lot of questions about bike signals, um, and happy to talk about that and try to answer some of those questions uh, in, the, in the following following item, a following session. So the, this notion, um, that was the traffic signal on the left side, the Williams intersection there, the Broadway-Williams intersection. Uh, how we made this, uh, I'd say that was, so we had a good, better than a best treatment. Um, how we made this the best treatment is we tied uh, what we did at the Williams intersection with the upstream traffic signal. And so here at Victoria intersection, 260 feet, uh, to the east, we added detection. Um, there's the green boxes there are, are just uh, trying to show that we have detection in the bike lane. When we, does detect, when we detect uh, bicycle traffic at the intersection of Victoria, we would send that information to the downstream intersection of Williams. And just like we have for car, for vehicle traffic in the past, we've designed the signals to make sure that if someone on a bike has stopped at Victoria, uh, that they will make it through the next series of two signals without stopping. So progressing, progressing, progressing that traffic, choosing a speed that would make make the bike traffic get through those signals. I mentioned the near side uh, four inch bike signal. This is some, a topic that many people have asked about this. Uh, one of the questions is uh, where in, in non US jurisdictions. Um, and useful, you know, questions about useful for bike compliance. You know, I think this is this is one where, yeah, certainly if you're, uh, you know, if you're if if you're coming to an intersection from an angle uh, and, and you're moving on your bike, then there is um, this, this auxiliary device, this additional um, display does help uh, someone on the bike catch catch their attention and, and clearly clearly communicate what we're trying to. Require them to do from a traffic control device standpoint. So we've we've done a, I think uh, we've used these at uh, probably a half dozen locations, consistent with the language in the MNCCD. Uh, these are not the primary. These are not the primary traffic signal or control device. Um, this is just a, a an additional uh, that tr is trying to clarify the control 
Um, so these are something that you might consider as you as you think about uh, these sorts of urban applications. Uh, again, another another picture of that the bike signals on the far side, uh, the, the near side display in this case hides uh, the pole hides the hides the far side display, but it's clearly there's a uh, it's controlling um, against that right turn. So when the right turn arrow there is green, um, this bike signal will also be red, and, and when the bike signal is green, that uh, that right turn arrow will be will be red. Uh, we have of course thought a little bit about detector markings um, and and detection. Um, very uh, very good number of questions related to this. Uh, there's been some research on this topic, uh, uh, and and uh, our, our, our colleagues in Columbia, Missouri, have had a, a FHWA request to experiment related to different markings. So you see on the right there, on the bottom, uh, on top of green markings is a uh, is the standard MATCD uh, bicycle detecting detector uh, symbol, the 9C7 marking, which is supposed to communicate to a user that this is where they put their bike to wait uh, for green. Um, we have done surveys to discern whether that's uh, exactly uh, useful um, and, and, and pertinent information that people can use. Um, and I think the answer is, well, that, that's a, it does confuse some users. And so the, there's some opportunities to talk about whether there's a better way to communicate that. Uh, just another quick look at that of this uh, this particular detection marking. So we have some examples of that that we'll, uh, we can get into later. Of course, different ways to detect. In this case, uh, in the previous case, we've been using inductive loop detectors underneath the uh, the concrete to do detection of cyclists and then mark it with this or another symbol. Um, and, and that's worked fairly well. Uh, and, and I think uh, depending on your situation and how effective your uh, your electrician signal electricians are at making sure that the equipment is set sensitive enough to detect uh, the bikes that are out there on the street. Another topic uh, I just need to touch on briefly is detected signal phasing. So here's an example again where the, the green, in this case, in downtown Chicago, the green indication is protecting uh, the bike movement from the left turn. Um, the, the, the adjacent uh, walk is on and then the adjacent green on the right hand side of the movement is, is also active. Um, so this essentially is when, you know, the, the opposite question is when do you protect uh, cyclists from the turning movements, whether it be right uh, in the previous example or the left turning example uh, in this picture. And, and it's still, again, uh, something that uh, the criteria is not set. Uh, the California METC had some um, guidance, uh, and and some would say that uh, that was uh, it was set up based on some reasonable principles uh, in, in terms of traffic uh, turning intensity, uh, amount of left turning traffic, and then bicycle traffic, um, and the cross product there, similar to what we've done with left turning uh, left turning traffic uh, warrants uh, for protected phasing and. Uh, but that's something that is a subject of, of some additional debate. So, uh, and there were again a, a good number of questions about that. Um, and I guess I would so I would say I'm afraid I can't uh, can't definitively answer uh, answer that. Um, but but certainly it, it really depends on the context and the level of traffic stress uh, that you're trying to trying to achieve. Certainly protecting the left turn from the bicycle traffic. That bicycle traffic will uh, obviously have less risk than 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 the, the latter. Uh, in Chicago, they, it was interesting. They were using uh, video detection to detect uh, bicycle traffic, and and we have uh, seen that across the industry. Um, I think some success with that, some questions about how important, how um, how necessary street lighting is to make sure that that detection is reliable. So that's a that's a big part of that um, big part of answering that question. The METC and the bicycle signal interim approval required no turn on red um, signs and, and for part time restriction. So we've, we've been using those in Portland um, as we've uh, been building bicycle signals where they where they we feel like those 
those, uh, those signs will help uh, improve the, the safety of the users on the system. And, and so that's a, it's a big part, either the, the again, the, the, the language in the sign um, or, uh, or, or a symbol, we, we've chosen to use the language in the sign. And then uh, other, so less, uh, less, um, uh, less restrictive signs. So this is the, the turning vehicle yield to bikes. There's the, of course, the turning vehicle yield to pedestrians. We modified that um, to include a, a, a situation where we had a through right shared lane and a bike lane to the right of that. So trying to address uh, the, the potential for right hook conflict um, with bikes, uh, bike traffic that's coming to, uh, and and down uh, down a street with a bike lane, uh, and, and studied this and, and had a, a paper uh, published at the Transportation Research Record that described that we did see reduced um, conflicts uh, with with the use of the sign. The yield and behavior did did improve. So I, I just have a you know few minutes left to talk about geometric changes. Clearly, there's elements that I don't have time to get into, the curve extensions, mixing zones, um, which New York City has done quite a bit of work in, and we've watched um, and with, uh, with interest with uh, how well those are working and what the level of comfort is with those. Of course, the Dutch, Dutch style protected intersections, there's an NCHRP project that's working on looking at that. And then uh, lastly, in this case, there's alternative intersection designs, diverging diamond interchange, continuous flow intersections that uh, raise some questions about how how these geometric changes will will uh, accommodate uh, people walking and biking at a traffic signal. Um, and then there's some another national cooperative higher research project on that as well. Uh, so uh, just to kind of wrap up the background on signal operations, we have really little knowledge regarding signal control strategies focused on pedestrians. Certainly, we've done a good amount in. Um, in, in Portland, looking at some of the old strategies that focus on safety, um, there are some efficiency-focused operations that we can uh, we have we have implemented, um, but haven't been very well described um, in both uh, in, in, in both uh, new ideas and then also um, past practices, and then even more limited knowledge for cycling. So that's uh, that's something that's uh, again. The National Cooperative Higher Research Program is is working working towards. Clearly, there's a whole uh, whole PDIC webinar and and and, and uh, learning module on leading pedestrian intervals. So I don't really need to go into much detail on that. You can probably look at that in the in the uh, in, in the archives. But uh, but certainly, uh, as you think about the criteria that you might employ, crash history being a big part of that. But then also risk, uh, the, the risk associated with people walking and, and the speed of traffic and challenging geometry. You don't have to wait for crashes to make those changes uh, and, and make improvements to the walking environment. You can implement the pedestrian interval. The one thing I will say about this is that we just we need more data on some of these. Um, it, it's, the crash modification factor says it's insufficient. Um, but I would argue again that we we know that there are uh, there's greater separation, and so there's there's a, certainly a, a correlation that can be formed there. Additional signal related research needs. Well, gosh, it's a it's a it's a long list. Um, I mentioned a few of them. Uh, there are a lot of questions again that uh, I, I can point to in in the in the session, and I'll I'll, I'll say it will you know if there is. Uh, possibility of a second webinar, we'll get into more detail related to those signal operation strategies. Um, the connected vehicle concepts, I know there was some discussion about automated vehicle uh, in the last uh, month or two that PBSE hosted that I was really keenly interested in, but certainly the other part of the puzzle is connected vehicles. So how, how might we um, think about uh, how vehicles will communicate to traffic signals and how we might use that information uh, and, and and, and have that uh, available um, as we as we go into perhaps an area where we would have connected people, uh, where you have information. If you're blind, um, maybe maybe you're you're uh, if you have a, a, a mobility device or a wheelchair. How do how do we get information to you um, in a in a in a way that is supportive of, of you traveling? Um, and, and does not uh, compromise your level of mobility. 
That's a big, big question that I, I, I think could provide some, provide some value for people that, uh, that could certainly use some, some help. And then multimodal signal performance measurement. This notion of, well, gosh, we have signal performance measures that are uh, identifying what the transportation system is like for cars if you're driving. Uh, but, but the notion of how traffic signals are working for, for all the other modes is really, a, I think, a, a need uh, that as a community we're, we're, we haven't been uh, attacking with the same rigor uh, as we have uh, for the, the vehicle side. And then finally, as I mentioned, traffic signal detection enhancement. Certainly, uh, you know, what, what are those signal uh, detection performance, uh, you know, the, the accuracy of, of signal detection? Uh, lots of questions about the accuracy. And, and, and again, um, I'd say that the, the industry has some challenges associated with how effective those are. We just get into signal operation strategy. There has been some research out of Portland State University um, Shrisha Kathuri, a, a colleague of mine that has looked at when you might uh, operate in a, uh, in a pedestrian recall sort of environment, uh, and really it's uh, tied to also the, the notion of how the signal is operated, whether it's coordinated or, or operating free, meaning without a background cycle length, meaning just detectors on all the different uh, all the different uh, movements. So um, this notion of how the volume to capacity ratio of the major street, how busy the major street is versus the amount of pedestrian activity on the side street uh, correlates to uh, what the best uh, performance can be for all users. And again, you can weight this based on your policy. So if you're, if you're, if you're mobility focused, then, then certainly you may consider uh, having uh, coordination be a big part of the puzzle. If you're in the middle there, um, there's different technology and, and ideas of priority logic uh, based on measuring how uh, busy the intersection is. And, and of course, this is over the 24 hours of the day. So how often we are getting requests for pedestrians tied to how often and how busy the traffic signal is. You can set that and have that be fluctuating throughout the time of day versus having a set schedule that may not be as responsive to performance of, of the intersection. The last couple pieces of the webinar and presentation that I wanna leave you with is uh, thinking about signal coordination uh, as, as referred to on that previous slide and, and doing different things within that signal coordination. So there are things like priority concepts and permissive links that you can adjust to make the signals more responsive to people walking. Um, and, and certainly I'll, I'll uh, give a quick uh, uh, shout out to some re research that Ed Smaglick from Northern Arizona University has been doing uh, to identify pedestrian priority and plans based on those volumes and getting into the traffic signal controller, in this case, in the Conolite machine, and putting in logic and looking at the range of possibilities related to how do we make the signal more responsive and then report back so that the engineer has information about what the delay is and whether that's acceptable based on the policies. I mentioned connected vehicle, it's worth repeating, uh, and not just connected vehicle, but also connected people. You can see in our uh, mock-up of this, uh, uh, this Portland example, we have, we have the people biking and walking um, also surrounded by some sort of halo that basically has, if it's a cell phone or if it's some sort of other device, we wanna make sure that they're part of the puzzle. So, so thinking, more about multimodal users, really it's required uh, as, we, as we think about the, uh, the density of an urban environment and, and clearly thinking about the comfort that people walking and cycling. I tried to do my best to, to catch on a, a good number of the questions. Um, I will uh, I'll be happy to take questions um, and if in the chat box and I'm gonna review some of the questions that came in. Uh, but I think Dan uh, wants to do a, a quick poll before we uh, uh, before we get into those questions specifically. Yeah, uh, thanks, Peter. I appreciate that. And and uh, Peter mentioned this, and I, I didn't really hit on it uh, as much toward the beginning. But based on all the interest in this topic and so many different areas where we could could do a deep dive, uh, we thought this would be a really good opportunity to lay 
lay out an overall foundation of concepts and um, and use it as an opportunity to really learn more from you all about what you want to hear more about. And I think uh, as we move forward, PBIC is going to be planning a sort of a, a series of, of follow up uh, conversations and presentations on specific topics. But um, I think it, having your input to help us guide that process would be really valuable. And we received a lot of questions on a variety of topics. We can get into those in just a moment. But uh, before I do that, I did want to offer you an opportunity to to pick a topic. Uh, we're going to force you to pick one with this poll question. Um, but we understanding that we, we would like to hit as many of these as possible. Is there one of these topics in particular you'd really like us to focus more attention on really in a deep dive uh, at a more advanced level in a future webinar where uh, we're thinking about what we can do next? And so this is really the first um, webinar and in, in what will hopefully be a series. So take a moment and, uh, and hit that. But Peter, I mean, reading through these choices uh, now, uh, bike, uh, bicyclist detection, uh, bicycle signal topics, progression speeds. I mean, you hit on a lot of these, but there's still, I think, a lot of questions on some of them that um, people just need more guidance, I think, on, on, on that. And I think um, you mentioned a few areas where research is going to be catching up, hopefully, on some of these. And we have another poll question on research in a minute. But, um, but I think uh, having your input on, on priorities moving forward, I think, will be really valuable for us uh, in, in planning future sessions. Um, uh, you'll notice that I added an other topic. Uh, we'd like you to send us other topics. If these don't hit it for you, if there's something else that you want to hear about, uh, please send that to us. We're going to be creating a running list um, as we move forward. I'll leave this open uh, for, for a moment. But uh, Peter, I wanted to just ask one initial question. Uh, and so it's a bit more of a broad uh, topic related to signals. Um, I think that Folks who may not know much about signals or have a very cursory understanding of, of doing things with signal timing often point to uh, some of the improvements you mentioned, adjusting signal timing phases, things like that, as sort of low cost uh, treatments for, for improving conditions for bicycling and walking, uh, especially when you compare them with the cost for maybe doing a lot of uh, big uh, construction projects, uh, rebuilding intersections, a lot of uh, sort of concrete work. Um, but I think you and I had a conversation a while back about how that's not always the case. I think there are some changes that may seem simple and seem low cost, but actually there might be a bigger investment required for some of these things. Can you speak at all to maybe the spectrum of costs uh, associated with signal timing improvements and signal changes um, in the scheme of all the things we could be doing to improve our intersections? Oh, sure, Dan. I, th I think it's, it's a wide range because of the uh, the nature of some of our equipment. And, you know, if, if I think about the, uh, the infrastructure in most cities, uh, especially in our downtown environments, uh, the equipment may be 35 or 40 years old. And so uh, adding a phase, a protected phase, or even a leading pedestrian interval could be difficult if the equipment is, is, is of that era where we just didn't have that level of uh, complexity. Uh, that being said, if you're in a sub more suburban environment where the traffic signal is less than 20 years old, it's likely that some of these lower cost improvements can be simple modifications to the traffic signal. So I'll just caution a little bit on the, some of the low cost. It really does depend. Of course, the other cost associated with the equipment is, is the structural um, the structural ability of a signal pole to handle additional traffic signal heads or additional loading of signs. That can be a barrier. Again, some of our older traffic signal poles don't meet today's structural standards. So trying to, you know, trying to retrofit uh, intersections in a low cost way can be held up um, in, in, su in some, some ways uh, because of the engineering uh, details associated with uh, additional equipment that are there. Um, but certainly things like adding detection and changing uh, the traffic signal timing to be more responsive, you know, those, those coordination settings um, are something that are, uh, the, the, the engineer may have to go out and look at, may have to go and see how it fits into the overall system. Um, so depending on the level of complexity of that system and, and the, uh, the uh, the, the size of the system um, that that is again a, another another could be another complicating factor. So it it does take some you know some assessment. I think uh, in all these cases, um, 
you know, there's a, there's a range of, of things. So um, I don't want to say they're, they're all easy to do. Um, it really depends on kind of picking your spots and working with the engineer to make sure that there's a, there's, there's a, there's an opportunity there. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. I think that that's a helpful, it provides helpful context. Cause I think some of us may be more familiar with costs associated with, with things like you're showing on your slide right now, maybe a green bike lane, a bike box, some pavement markings versus maybe doing some uh, uh, curb extensions or bulb outs, but we're not so familiar with, with what it costs, what it really requires to, to do some of these improvements. So I, I think that's really helpful. I'm gonna show briefly the, the input we got from our poll just now. Uh, please continue to send your topics, obviously, but this is what we saw about um, a, almost an even tie uh, between the uh, prioritizing bicyclist detection and the whole idea of progression speeds and speed management um, are really important, followed by uh, bicycle signals, obviously another big one, scramble crossings, and so many other great topics that were suggested, accessibility, accessible pedestrian signals, what to do for people with low vision, um, and, and that whole range of topics that we could address. Uh, a lot of, about um, selecting appropriate locations uh, for new traffic signals, and that's something I wanted to ask a question about, Peter, if we have some time. So so a lot of good topics that we, that we are, are receiving from you now. We're going to do um, a lot of work to figure out how best to address these um, in, in the future. But while we have you, Peter, and um, we've got about half an hour, I want to just roll through some of these questions because we got so many um, and I'd like to, to see uh, if we can if we can address them. So uh, a lot of questions on your diagonal crossing. Uh, and I think that that I'd venture to say that's probably not something a lot of people were uh, so familiar with. Um, and so if, if you can scroll back to that area, we have a few questions. A few questions about um, how that, what's the detection for the bicyclist at that particular uh, crossing? How are, how are the cyclists detected there? Here's the slide, yeah. I was just curious if you could revisit that. Sure, uh, in this case, uh, actually in both these cases, uh, the detection uh, for this was an inductive loop. Um, so uh, we, uh, we, in Oregon, uh, what's frequently used is a, is a quadrupole loop, but the rectangular um, it's four feet wide. Traditionally, it can be narrower, uh, but four feet wide by six or eight feet uh, can be actually a variable length. So they just cut in, uh, cut into the pavement, or it could be preformed in the concrete. They could lay it in, lay in the loop, and then pour the concrete on top of it uh, with the wires that just communicate um, that back to just like measuring for cars. Um, there's been some good research um, showing that the accuracy you know, it's a well-calibrated loop is, is 100%. Um, of course, the challenge is you have to calibrate the loop and make sure that it's in the right place. And, and so sometimes uh, the location, if I if you think about a bike box, the, the detection of, of a cyclist in a bike box or a two-stage Q-turn box, that has been a bit of a challenge for us is where do you put the loops? How do you make sure that you're getting all the users. So this trade-off of inductive loops, we're, we're, we're very, you know, in, in, in my experience, we've been very good with detecting people on bikes with inductive loops. Um, the problem is if, if the people there are, are not clear on where they should be, um, that's when we run into trouble because they could be waiting, you know, just, just to the, just four feet away or a, a foot in front of it. Uh, and there is a sensitivity that sometimes the detection will not will not detect you if you're not located in, a, in the right spot. So we've done, in this case, actually, uh, Clack this is Clackamas County's example. They actually have a weight here um, that they put as text on the uh, on the on the ground um, uh, just to try to help clarify. Uh, there's a example. Uh, we can we could spend a good amount of time on the various detection techniques and and the different applications we've used and, and not only at the stop bar or in this case the, the traffic signal but also in a two-stage cue box or, or the bike box so uh thanks for that peter it, the, a lot of questions then too about this is apparently and, and it feels very much that this is a bicycle only crossing is that the case or are you seeing pedestrians using this as well uh we do see pedestrians uh, mostly uh, joggers, you know, longer distance joggers, uh, they are savvy about uh, using the bike signal. Uh, and, and, and so they will, uh, people jogging or running in this case, will, will run through on a diagonal. Uh, most people walking are, 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 are using it as a pedestrian. 
Um, the, the Portland example here, um, we, uh, we, we have the bike signal, but uh, not a lot of demand for people walking, so probably less, less so uh, in terms of the people, people walking diagonally here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. And um, sorry, one more, back to the question about detection. Um, you, you got loose there, but did you, did you say anything about whether you considered, you mentioned a, a few things about radar and video. Um, can you talk about the decisions that you, you just found the, the loops to be more reliable? Is that what you were getting at? We, we have used video um, at a few locations where we couldn't, Use loops, uh, so we, we've uh, you know that it takes some calibration, of course, to to discern uh, cyclists, uh, especially at night. Uh, the, the the challenge um, challenges is really with with night. In fact, I was just reviewing uh, not only video but microwave detection as another uh, possibility. Uh, we've, we've had some good success. Not a lot of studies have been done on that, so it's something that uh, I'd say. We say approach that with caution. It's it's part of that uh, the effectiveness of any system that you use, whether it be loops or or, or, or microwave or or um, you know uh, video. It's really it's really got to be a function of do the the people that are setting it up do they understand the equipment? Can they maintain it? Are they um, are they are they working to to calibrate to make sure that it's good for the different conditions, not only nighttime but you know, all weather, uh, and, and of course, uh, the, the, the challenge is associated with what are you trying to do with that? Are you, um, you know, are you providing, uh, you know, are you providing responsive, um, you know, I think somebody mentioned, um, you know, instant gratification uh, and immediate response, and, and the answer is, well, yeah, you, if, you're, if you're not, then you have to detect people for maybe a longer time. Uh, and and it can, the, can the equipment do that? Is, is there a variety of questions there? Um, so the best uh, signal detection is really uh, a combination of what the, the people that are involved think and then, and then how it's designed to make, uh, make it work, work the best way possible. Okay. I'm, while we're on the topic of detection and signal activation, actuation, I, a lot of questions came in about on the pedestrian side of things and wondering about making decisions about um, where to where to use pedestrian recall, where you're giving pedestrians the signal every time versus uh, push buttons to use, uh, even some questions about passive detection for pedestrians. I don't know, from your perspective and the work you've done, what have you found to be the best uh, ways to maybe decide between options um, and uh, and make decisions uh, about about that? And yeah, great slide for this. I remember you touched on it a bit. Yeah, and this slide, uh, I think at, uh, you know, at Portland State, the uh, Shreesha Kathuri had worked on, um, you know, makes it, I think, uh, easy. I think it's really based on context uh, it, for me, in addition to this. Um, so if you have pedestrians every cycle, then it, it comes easy. It's, it's, you can, you know, re, you, you can just put in a pedestrian recall and, 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 and have that work every single cycle without having people have to look for a push button. Um, I think the, the the reality is you don't have pedestrians every single cycle. You have them depending on uh, the context, and, and of course, in the middle of the night, that's the, when I get calls and complaints um, from people that are driving, or even people that are biking. In some cases, when when they have to stop and there's nobody there, uh, you know, they they are they're wondering why. And, and part of that is, well, we may not have a button. We we didn't uh, install a button at the same time, or we by policy didn't think it was important to do that. So there have been cases where we, um, you know, we have put in push buttons. Uh, and I like to say is often we, we can, um, we, we're putting in push buttons where we, uh, we, we think that the demand is not gonna be very high. Uh, we can always put it on PED recall. Uh, today, the button does serve a function of a locator tone if it's an accessible button. So um, even, if, even if we have a new signal, we are putting in buttons often uh, because we want people that are blind to have that locator tone that helps them navigate through the intersection. So that's a, that's a big part of the uh, design question that's happening right now is, is um, how we're designed for the people with limited, limited visibility. Um, but yeah, we, you know, in many cases, it, uh, it depends on the situation um, and the context. Uh, if it's, a, you know, certainly a suburban environment um, where, 
uh, it's dominated by cars who are, who are using buttons and, and or uh, we're being you know cautious about how um, how it's uh, you know how it's how much if you have to push the button how much delay that you're going to experience one of the things we want to try to do if there's no traffic on the major street and you push the button we want it to be responsible to you so that's that free you know operating it free we can we can make that traffic signal um, we have, give you um, near immediate gratification if not uh, you can certainly think about the policy suggests that we should be reducing delay for people walking um, and the best way to do that actually is by having a push button um, that uh, that gives us information that we can act upon yeah okay um, shifting gears just a bit to uh, you you mentioned uh, leading pedestrian intervals a topic that we did cover in a previous webinar I dropped the link into the chat pod if anybody's looking for that I'll try to uh, revisit it again but the other side of this, a lot of questions about a leading bicycle interval, uh, something that maybe not a lot of folks are, are using or have come across. Uh, and I, I guess I'm just asking, Peter, for your overall perspectives on, on a leading bicycle interval, is this uh, something you're seeing commonly used? Is it something you've been involved with actually using in, uh, in your work in, in Portland? Or um, is it, and how, I guess, what are the options as you currently see them within what's permitted with the MUTCD uh, interim approvals uh, for bicycle signals. Uh, is this something that's in the toolbox or are we still needing to see a bit more research on this topic? Yeah, it's, uh, I'd say it's, uh, it's, a bit, it's not explicitly described in, in the manual of uniform traffic for devices. So uh, with that being said, then it means that it is in the toolbox. I think there are some challenges with leading bicycle interval that isn't present with a leading pedestrian interval and in the research that Portland State has done it's not published yet but it's uh they, they've been they collected a lot of video data to look at the complex and certainly there are you know without a lean bicycle interval certainly you have a conflict at the start of green uh, and that's what we're trying to avoid with the lean bicycle interval uh, the, the risk uh, what the leading bicycle interval does essentially, of course, is give the green a bike, you know, the bike a green head start. Um, the the so what it does is just it shifts the risk a bit. So um, you still have a situation where you have a a green bike movement and and the, and the cars are going to be given either a flashing yellow in, in the case of their research. Um, or some other display, and so that that just means that there's still a potential for conflict. And the the thing that's subtly different with leading bike intervals than leading pedestrian intervals, of course, is the speed of bicycle traffic. And and can can people driving discern that there is a pending conflict? It's one of the reasons we've used this uh, turning vehicle yield to bikes sign in Portland. We have um, you know we have detection upstream of the intersection that warns the motorists that there is a bike that may be present, you know, after they have gotten their green. Um, they may not see a bike at the start of their green. They may be starting to move and, and, and to yield to a pedestrian, uh, but there could be a bike that's coming that they just can't see because of the speed of bike, bicycle traffic. So it is, it is a challenge that exists. Um, with uh, with the right turn or left turn, it, it, depending on where you are. Um, uh, so the left turn is more prevalent in New York City with a lot of the one ways and the bike left left side bike lanes. Um, so we use this warning sign. You know, you could argue that this isn't the, the right warning sign. This isn't the, the, the most. Uh, this may be confusing to users. Um, you know, that that initial glance. Uh, you know, it's not immediately discernible. Um, of of, uh, of what you should be doing, uh, but we did identify in our complex study that having the sign, the before and after, showed that there were less, the potential for less severe conflicts. So, um, some sort of a warning sign like this um, could be useful in terms of warning of a pending conflict. Okay, very good. Um, I wanted to talk now a bit, Peter, about uh, some of your your slides on progression speeds. Um, in downtown areas, especially, we've got the ability to maybe um, set things at a lower speed uh, for, for progression. A couple of comments that this is seems like it's a little easier to do when you've got one-way um, streets as opposed to two-way traffic. Can you talk a bit about 
uh, making those decisions on on two way streets. If you've got any examples of of that, or is this yeah, mainly? Clearly, a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Clearly, one way streets is the majority of my examples. Um, it's the easiest application. Um, uh, because you're you're essentially only worried about that one direction of travel, you're not you're not looking at it. Um, but certainly, if you think about the wide variety of, of situations, the two-way traffic, um, the predominant traffic that we're progressing, this, we can we can choose that speed and then and then consider what the off-peak is. Actually, Los Angeles uh, and their grid system in downtown uses a 30 mile an hour speed. Uh, for two-way traffic, um, just the way the signals are set up. Um, so it's interesting to contemplate, you know, the cities that do have two-way, uh, if they could apply the same sort of principle. Certainly, there's not the same symmetry, um, but but clearly there's a there's a mathematical relationship associated with the speeds and the distance between intersections. That uh, you know, if you if you think about the challenging, I like to always say is we should be challenging the assumptions that we've used. Progression speed, and that's the right speed for all all users. Um, if we are Vision Zero, if we're contemplating Vision Zero sort of uh, environment, um, you know, a lower speed is, uh, is 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 going to get us to that goal. So, um, and then of course, the longer the cycle length is, the more um, actually some really nice research that Peter Firth just did um, using uh, VSIM simulation is is to say. The longer the cycle length is, the more likelihood you have a higher variability of speed. Um, so his, his research suggests that a lower cycle length um, will, will essentially help to calm traffic. You'll have a, uh, a essentially a situation where it, uh, uh, the speeds can be controlled by essentially um, creating more turnover, which is uh, which, which which theoretically makes a lot of sense to me. The, the the that that sort of um, notion and that research tends to it's, it's validating the assumptions and the the principles that are described in the NACTO Urban Street Design Guide. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, that, that's a that's a good point. Uh, I, a couple of questions on top of that. Um, there are, a, there are a few folks who seem to be addressing working on projects where they're trying to. Do something like this, or trying to get some of these signal lengths or the progression speeds down, uh, but are having issues because the corridors are trying to do these problems on uh, intersect with uh, with uh, prioritized transit uh, corridors, like some rail lines that cross over. And wondering if you faced any issues with working on something a little bit more coordinated uh, in terms of progression speed, but having to deal with maybe cr uh, intersecting transit lines and, and rail lines and things that may be uh, interrupting your ability to to fully coordinate that. Oh, clearly, uh, you know, whether it's uh, whether it's rail or whether it's really very busy, you know, highways. Clearly, there's a design decision that has to be made there, um, and and that's something that uh, you know the kind of the old school traffic engineer in me says, well, gosh, maybe maybe you shouldn't try to coordinate. Maybe you shouldn't, you know, have that critical intersection that you're crossing. Be the determination for all the cycling. So you know, it really just depends on on the on the conditions and, and the, of course the volumes and 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 the wide variety of expectations. Um, you know, one of our situations we we started with a 30 mile an hour. And we knew we wanted to get to lower than that in terms of traffic speeds. Um, so we we took a, a you know a, a kind of a two two phase approach where we said well. We're not going to get from 30 to 15 miles an hour, so we'll let's, let's try 30, and then you know go from 30 to 22, and then maybe go from 22 to 15 to try to try to make sure that you're you're making subtle changes instead of you know throwing you know throwing uh, throwing the, the what you have you know and and throwing in disarray that you can't get to your ultimate goal. So yeah, thinking about that in terms of the context of of when. Uh, when it's appropriate to do different things based on rail or or, or the the busy highway crossing or, or, or transit priority is is a challenge that you have to take into account and be very very uh, deliberate about how you you go from where you are today to where you want to get and maybe you know two maybe two iterations or even three if you have to. Yeah. Um, a couple more questions, Peter. Here, um, one um, 
there, there are some questions from people who are uh, working on improving crossings, specifically asking about pedestrian crossings at uh, uncontrolled locations, uncontrolled intersections along corridors where there might be a huge distance between traffic signals, uh, where uh, they might be able to add a, an extra level of protection to crossings for pedestrians and bicyclists. But they've got a lot of uncontrolled intersections in between and wondering about maybe they're going to be putting in like something like a pedestrian hybrid beacon to facilitate crossings at those locations or maybe they'll try to go full traffic signal uh, installation a little bit more intense in terms of uh, maybe an investment but weighing the pros and cons of fully signalizing uh, some of these locations with the overall goal is maybe we can increase our signal density along this whole corridor and maybe do something a little bit more coordinated um, as opposed to maybe a pedestrian hybrid beacon where you can't really coordinate that with some of your signals I, I at least that's the understanding. So I don't know if you've, you didn't really touch a lot on adding new signals and maybe weighing that with, with other options, maybe that are lower, uh, lower cost, um, a little bit of a step down from a full signal. But can you talk about the, that decision-making process and what people might want to think about before they just start trying to flood their corridors with new traffic signals? Yeah, I think, you know, the, the MTC obviously provides some guidance on different hybrid beacons and warrants for those. Uh, the NCHRP 562 project is really fundamental in terms of changing some of the thinking related to how we might incorporate uh, rep flash beacons. So those are great documents to do, you know, to kind of start, start from, um, to start as a basis. Uh, you know, I think the the, the more uh, the more I'm involved in in projects, the the the, the more uh, attentive I am to street lighting and just illumination and making sure you know a lot of the crashes that are happening mid block that are happening are um, are uh, you know we need to improve the visibility of people walking so so people driving can can stop for them and that's so that's a that's a low cost. But certainly, uh, people aren't going to cross if it's if it's you know if there's a median barrier that's it's, it's impossible to cross. So um, you know if you think about pedestrian scale medians, um, making sure that they're traversable by people walking and people in wheelchairs, you know the physical barriers are are, are safer, making the risk. Um, and the NCHRP 562 talks about that. You know, can you can you reduce the length of the crossing? You know, we've had a lot of examples. And you see these all over the news of you know if people just couldn't make it across the four lane the four lane or six lane highway. Um, so that the double threat you may have one person yielding to you, but the person in the adjacent lane doesn't. Um, so those are really you know really hugely important. Um, if you think about coordinating, I guess the, the pedestrian beacon you can you can coordinate those depending on the the traffic controller in the traffic. Uh, the pedestrian hybrid beacon. Um, so you, you can coordinate those. It is possible to use the same signal controller uh, and, and the same logical use for for full signals. Um, you know, of course, uh, with pedestrian hybrid beacons, uh, there's been some people that have said, "Well, no, I know we want these to be uh, we want these to be immediately activated," and and, that, and that's again, that's a, that's a setting. Um, that, that can be that does prioritize people walking, um, uh, but uh, but but certainly has may have an impact on on cars or even buses um, that are coming down the, the the main street. So these are settings that are, are important. Um, the spacing, of course, the spacing criteria um, is something that's really it's uh, up to the individual jurisdiction. Yeah. Uh, the longer yeah. the spacing, the more the more challenging it may. Uh, may become for for people that are trying to walk or or bike. So um, you really have to think about it in terms of the the the, the network. Uh, you know, there's of course a big emphasis on complete streets. So I like to think about it as complete networks. Can somebody walking or biking get get with a adequate level of comfort? Can they can they get where they want to go? And those traffic signals and pedestrian beacons can be a big part of that. So that, uh, yeah. that that's going to be a part of the puzzle. No, that's useful. I, I think that helped. That that was that was useful for uh, kind of thinking about those options that that are available at least, and uh, and weighing weighing them uh, against each other. I, I think this is as good a time as any to launch my the next poll that I wanted to open up, which is some of the, one topic that you got to Peter was um just need some better information on some of the topics. We don't know everything now, and we need more research. And so uh, this is another question for you all. Uh, the, the sort of 
presuming that you all are the, really the end users of, of the guidance that's coming out, the research findings, what do you want to see? What would help back up your decisions? And so some of these were ones uh, were research topics that Peter uh, proposed, maybe some better um, information on generating level of traffic stress for intersections, uh, improving our, our detection methodology, uh, maybe multimodal signal performance measurement, uh, guidelines and warrants for, for phasing uh, bicycle signals. Um, uh, we'd like to hear your uh, feedback on those. Uh, while we're doing that, uh, Peter, I, I've got another uh, question. Uh, people, people are interested to peek inside, peek onto your bookshelf and, and your library of resources. And do you have any good, really good standby uh, guidelines or documents that you'd recommend for um, uh, for just all things signals, maybe signal timing uh, manuals, uh, references that you point people to that maybe for further reading or that they should maybe think about stealing from for their own local guidelines. Well, well, certainly the signal timing manual. Um, you know, I was the author of the first edition with a lot of help from my colleagues at uh, Kittleson Associates uh, back when I was uh, a consultant. Um, you know, and the Texas Transportation Institute. Uh, those, those, uh, and gosh, the list goes on and on. Um, but that 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 document uh, does talk about policies, and so I think um, if you're working with an engineer, that maybe uh, you know maybe is not as uh, not as uh, excited about uh, making traffic signals work for cycling and walking. You know, can start kind of start there. It's like that we have we. Uh, have we contemplated what our, you know, what our city goals are, or county or regional goals, whichever, or state goals? What do they say? What do those goals say? Do we have a, you know, do we have a, a intended uh, mode split? Do we have a, uh, are we trying to, are we really trying to improve the safety for people walking? And if so, um, you know, what does that mean? How have we changed? Have we changed our signal timing? Have we updated it in the last 15 years since those policies were updated? You know, if we're, if we're trying if the old signal timing is, you know, 15 years old and it's 150 second cycle length that's trying to speed cars through at 55 miles an hour, you know, that may not be, that may not, you know, meet the needs of, of today's, uh, today's uh, uh, community. So, you know, I, that on, on my bookshelf, you know, it's that signal timing manual. I have, uh, you know, I'm a, I'm an avid reader of urban studies um, books. So Jeanette Sadakan Street Fight is another one that's on my, it's on my uh, bookshelf at home, um, and uh, that and uh, a bunch of other, uh, you know, books from either James Howard Kunstler or, uh, or, or old uh, Jane Jacobs books that uh, I still I still go back to it for inspiration to think about how we're, you know, how we're supposed to be, um, how we're supposed to be as transportation planners and engineers, how we're supposed to be thinking about how what, what the work we do and how it affects our communities. Yeah, no, those are, those are great uh, recommendations that I think uh, maybe some people are familiar with and others they may not be. I, I didn't want to uh, miss the opportunity to share the results of the poll here. Um, some some pretty clear standouts. I, I think uh, a lot of you told me you can't limit your choice to just one thing. So um, I agree with you and, and all these on our, are on our radars and others that you've mentioned to us. Uh, we want to get these into the right hands of uh, folks at uh, FHWA, maybe uh, TRV. We can talk about them in January and, and figure out how to get these topics uh, really in the queue for future research. So all seem very important. And uh, Peter, I think you've laid out a really good foundation of knowledge um, at, 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 a, at that high level that we needed today. Um, I wanted to mention again to you all that this is really going to be the first step in, in what will be a multi-part series of, of uh, future webinars, other conversations, maybe some guidance that we can develop coming out of this um, to really help you make these decisions about your uh, traffic signals and intersections. Um, but I, I'm sad to say that we've run out of time uh, for today's session. I will be letting you all know uh, as soon as we schedule anything more on these topics. Uh, I've got your contact information. You'll be receiving some information from me about uh, what's to come. Uh, but I, I, I want to thank Peter uh, Koontz very much for spending so much time with us today and really talking through, sharing your perspective on these issues. Um, and I'm hoping that uh, we'll be able to have you back again soon and, and continue the discussion. Um, I just want to let you all know, uh, the attendees, as you, as you uh, close out the webinar today, you're going to be receiving uh, or sent to a very brief poll. We would really appreciate your feedback on the webinar today. If you happen to think of something you didn't send us in the chat pod, that's a great opportunity to send it to us in your comments. Uh, let us know what other topics we should be covering. Um, and be on the lookout for your email later today. That's going to have a link to generate your certificate for the webinar, uh, your um, 
link to the webinar slides if you want to review those, as well as the video recording, which should be available tomorrow if you want to share this uh, webinar with anybody else. But um, Peter, thank you again. Uh, thanks to all of you for attending, uh, and I hope you all have a great day. Thanks very much.